Hello everyone and welcome to the lecture on cardiac arrhythmias and pacemakers. As the name implies, we are going to go through various types of heart arrhythmias and then we're going to talk just briefly about a few of the different types of pacemakers you might see in patients. So this is sinus arrhythmia. So I don't know if you remember, we, had, we talked about the heart being in sinus rhythm before. So do you remember what the word sinus referred to? Right, it refers to the sinoatrial node. So if somebody's in sinus rhythm, remember it's, it's in the normal rhythm because that depolarization is starting in the SA node and then spreading through the rest of the heart. Sinus arrhythmia, of course, means we're still starting the heartbeat from the SA node, but we're just not starting it on a regular basis. If we take a look at all the, the waveforms on the EKG, we can see everything looks normal. So here's our normal P wave. We have our QRS complex and then our T wave. So we have a P, Q, R, S, T. Now here we have a big gap, but we still start again with the P, Q, R, S, T. So the fact that we have a P wave in front of every QRS complex means the SI node is working just the way it's supposed to be, but it's just not working at the right timing. Um, the rate. If we, if we could count this out, I'm not going to do it right now, but uh, we could count this and figure out the rate. But the rate usually is maybe slightly faster than normal. Could be in the 60 to 8 to 5, but you might see a rate up to about 100 beats a minute. However, there's nothing really wrong with it. It's just a little bit of an irregular rhythm, but it's not irregular enough that it's going to create any problems delivering blood to the, to the body. It doesn't get affected with activity or exercise. So really, we don't even treat this. It's not even don't even need any treatment. Another really common type of arrhythmia that you're going to hear about is atrial fibrillation or AFib. And this is um, very, this, this arrhythmia is, is in the atrial contraction phase of the heart cycle. And it's because of the, de, the depolarization is not routine or normal throughout the atria. So what happens is instead of just the SA node, if you look here on the left, instead of just the depolarization starting in this SA node and then spreading through the atria in a, in a normal fashion, giving rise to this normal P and then QRST complex, what we have are a number of what are called ectopic pacemaker sites. In other words, all these little circular arrows, they think they're the SA node. So they will start erratically depolarizing even though the SA node may have already sent out a depolarization signal, but then we have all these little um, independent kingdoms here who want to be the SA node, and so they try to depolarize. And so what you see is um, you don't necessarily see a P wave. So can't quite see it here. Here's our QRS. We definitely had another QRS with no uh, P wave intervening. So you don't get good um, normal depolarization of the atria and you get a lot of irregularity here. If you look at the R waves, which is of course the ventricle, QRS is the ventricle depolarizing. It depolarizes, but just not in a normal sequence and there's not always a P wave. So here's a P wave before the QRS, but there's not one here. So this is a problem because if the atria are contracting and there's no blood to send down to the ventricle because they're contracting too much, then you're not gonna be able to um, have good cardiac output. So this could actually be one of the causes of heart failure. And so we definitely need to treat this. And so it's either treated with medication or it'll, they'll treat it with what's called a cardioversion. In other words, they'll electrically um, charge or stimulate the heart and get rid of these little fake little uh, uh, SA nodes here, these little ectopic areas. They may also do an ablation, which is where they go in and just kind of kill off these little abnormal areas and then the SA node will go back to doing its normal pacing. Another example, now so that's that's an atrial fibrillation. We can also see disorders of conduction of the heart through the ventricle part of it. And so one of those is premature ventricular contractions or PVCs. And again, this is an early beat coming out of the ventricle but it's not because the atria is goofed up, it's because the ventricle is too, too eager. And um, 
the other thing that you see is there's kind of a really big spike here. So here, here's the normal pattern, P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T, and then this really big spike of contraction of the, um, of the ventricle. And then we go back to P, Q, R, S, T, we got a couple of those. And then again, here we have this big spike. So it's a really hard, forceful contraction. We see that by the increased intensity here of the, of the waveform. And it, with the absence of an atrial contraction, the ventricle is contracting, but if the atria haven't contracted, what's the problem? No blood is moved from the atria to the ventricle. So what would be the point of the ventricles contracting without any blood? So you get that happening too many times, you're going to have a severe cardiac output problem. So more than six PVCs per minute that occurs would be an indication just to treat this with medication. So the next one is ventricular tachycardia. So I know you know tachycardia means fast, and to be diagnosed, this would be um, well over 100 beats a minute, which is what we normally think of with tachycardia. This can be 150, even 200 beats a minute. So the problem with that, again, is the ventricles, if they're contracting that quickly, they do not have time to fill with blood. And so even though the heart rate's gone up, you actually have a drop in cardiac output, and we can, and in addition, since cardiac output in general is going down, we definitely see an impact on the heart directly because the blood flow through the coronary arteries is also diminished significantly. So this can be very dangerous if it persists, of course, and so we would treat this immediately with medications or they may, if this is a persistent problem, this may be a time where they implant a defibrillator um, or another form of pacemaker to treat this because ventricular tachycardia can become a, a life-threatening, immediately life-threatening con condition called ventricular fibrillation. So this is fibrillation, very chaotic. So there's just like twitching and uh, um, fluttering. Remember when we did e-stim and you didn't quite get the e-stim up and you had a lot of fasciculation? That's kind of what ventricular fibrillation is. It's kind of fasciculations of the ventricle. So this is really um, ineffective and basically there's no cardiac output because there's no time for the blood to, flow, to fill in the ventricle and the contraction's not forceful or organized enough to be able to actually eject any blood that would be there. So you can see here, um, heart rate, can you even imagine a heart rate of 400 or 500 beats a minute? But it's, it's meaningless to even try to count it. Definitely no P wave, um, but just this chaotic fibrillation. So this has to get addressed immediately because if the person isn't um, if defibrillation doesn't occur, then, then this is the person that's going to die. And if you recall back again to your CPR training, this is why there are so many defibrillators, automated defibrillators spread out around everywhere is because this is the problem. If somebody goes into cardiac arrest um, because of angina or myocardial infarction, this is what they're worried about happening. They're worried that if that per ischemia persists, it's going to eventually result in ventricular fibrillation and then the person without immediate um, conversion, cardioversion, is, is not going to be able to make it. So these are the arrhythmias. Uh, basically I just want you to know, you know what the terms mean and what the impact is and, um, and, and I think that's enough. You're going to see particularly AFib in somebody's past medical history you may see somebody being treated with an implantable placemaker or defibrillator because of their history of ventricular fibrillation. So you should at least know what they mean and, and what they indicate. I do want to talk a little bit about pacemakers. Uh, it's far more complicated and I don't think we need to understand all the technical different versions and you, I'm sure you can imagine new pacemakers are coming out all the time. I don't think we need to understand all that. but. Uh, we do need to understand in general what a pacemaker is and of course it's one of those uh, the presence of a pacemaker is a contraindication to a lot of the different types of modalities that we do with patients so we certainly need to know when they have one so this is a pretty basic um, cardiac pacemaker and these have actually been around for a while the first one was actually developed in the early 50s but it consists of a little battery pack that gets placed directly under the skin so if you're ever wondering if a patient has a pacemaker um, and it's always on the left side of the chest. 
you can just kind of feel right under their um, clavicle on the left side of their chest and you will be able to feel a, a pretty sizable lump probably a little bit bigger than like a half dollar and it's it's very it, it'll create a lump because it's right under the skin so you'll be able to feel it and basically then from there that's the battery pack and and the sensors and there are uh, electrical leads in this case this is going to the right atria and the right ventricle and it's a demand pacemaker will sense the spontaneous activity so let's say the heart's beating just fine and then all of a sudden there's some abnormal beats. Uh, the pacemaker is going to sense that and fix it, but otherwise it's not going to do anything. So it's a demand pacemaker is only going to respond to abnormalities that it senses. A uh, dual chamber pacemaker wants to be able to kind of create normal cardiac function. So um, it's going to be sensing activity both in the atria and the ventricles, and that's probably what we have pictured here and then it's either going to again inhibit or trigger the stimulus. A sequential pacemaker senses activity in the ventricles and again it can stimulate or inhibit those. And then an optimally, op optimal sequential pacemaker really does a lot of the same thing. So I'm not going to try to ask you to distinguish between any of these. Um, here's more of an internal look of the dual chamber pacemaker. So you see the lead um, sitting here in the ventricle right by the SA node and then again down right in the atria I'm sorry right at the SA node and then down into the ventricle of course um, you could have you can see that sitting in there and so again it's sensing and then also putting out stimuli um, what's a little bit different is an implantable cardioverter or defibrillator and this would be what you'd use for somebody with tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, or ventricular fibrillation, because that's going to essentially give them a jolt. It's going to um, defibrillate them, just much like you know you put the paddles on them. That's essentially what's going to happen. So uh, it is important to know if your patient has a defibrillator versus a pacemaker, because the defibrillator can make them kind of pass out for a second, or they'll fall if it kind of jolts them. So if you're walking or doing some gait training with someone, um, when in the past when I've worked, I always I don't care how independent they are, if they're working with me, it means they're not quite as stable as we'd like them to be, and so I keep my hand on that gait belt. Um, and the point of this, of course, is to re to kind of shock the heart and restore it back to a normal rhythm if it senses either ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. So that's it. This was a, a short and sweet little video just going over arrhythmias and then just a little bit about cardiac pacemakers. That's all we're going to do for this one. So hope you enjoyed it and have a good day.